I'm happy to announce that March 1st is the official release date of the New Thinking Aloud magazine's first quarterly issue. You can download free PDF copies from the website of the New Thinking Aloud Foundation. If you like a high-quality printed edition as a collectible, you can order it from magcloud.com. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove Hello and welcome, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring consciousness in the cosmos. With me is cosmologist Jude Curavan, who is the author of The Cosmic Hologram. She is also co-author with Irvin Laszlo of a book called Cosmos. Some of her other titles include The Eighth Chakra, The Wave, and The Thirteenth Step. Welcome. Jude. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. <laughs> and I, you are somewhat unique amongst the uh, cosmologists that uh, I know because you have a serious interest in parapsychology. Well, it's not an interest, it's mm. an experience. Mm -hmm. I experienced what you know I call supernormal phenomena since mm -hmm. I was very small. And for me, they're not supernatural, they're not paranormal, they're supernormal attributes and phenomena mm -hmm. that we all innately have. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, from your perspective, consciousness uh, pervades the whole universe, the whole cosmos, and perhaps beyond. I'm not sure there is a beyond to the cosmos in the sense that, you know, <laughs> at its biggest form, you know, the cosmos is all there is, has ever been, will be. But that sense of an infinite mm -hmm. and eternal cosmic mind, as mm -hmm. Einstein called it, of which universes are universes, yeah. one, are finite thought forms, uh -huh. and we are microcosmic co-creators mm -hmm. of its realities. You do use the term, the I think you call it the cosmic plenum? Yeah, plenum as a sort of sense of what lies beyond what we call space-time. Mm -hmm. So space-time, energy matter space-time, our universe is an emergent phenomenon of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So what lies outside space-time is what I'm calling the cosmic plenum, but essentially it's the mind of God, it's the cosmic mind. Mm -hmm. and, and you use that term in a way that uh, suggests familiarity. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, as you, you're, you're grinning, and I think <laughs> rightly to, to grin. I've experienced multidimensional realities all my life, well, since I was four years old, and mm -hmm. been aware of them. So from that age, I've experienced precognition, telepathy, out-of-body experiences, many other I've walked between worlds, essentially, mm -hmm. all my life, and I've communicated with many discarnate intelligences, um, as well as, obviously, many incarnate mm -hmm. wisdom keepers. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very much been that exploration of, of the nature of reality itself mm -hmm. that's been a life Well, that's journey. very revealing. <laughs> I mean, most of the scientists I interview who have had these experiences are quite hesitant to speak of them so openly. Well, you know, in our age especially, mm -hmm. you know, I'm quite a private person, but, you know, if I'm to, to be in service to, you know, what I'm calling the whole world view and the understanding of that and the experiencing that, the embodying of that unity awareness, mm -hmm. then I just feel I need to be transparent, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's nothing hidden. And if people disagree, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not hiding anything in that well, sense. Well, in addition to being uh, open and to being um, a, a fine theorist, and I encourage our viewers to look at some of the you know, previous interviews we've done, you have made a point of uh, going through the academic literature to find support for your ideas and, and 
as well for the uh, uh, supernormal experiences of consciousness that you you've had. Oh, very much so. I mean, I, I, I really seek to bring that sort of understanding mm -hmm. um, together with the experience. And so, absolutely, and certainly in my, my latest book, The Cosmic Hologram, I cite something like 140 academically peer-reviewed papers through from something like 500 researchers, not just in physics, mm -hmm. but across many, many different fields of research to bring together the evidence yeah. and the emerging evidence mm -hmm. for this whole world view of the cosmic hologram. Well, and, and our viewers will know that I have a background uh, in parapsychology, Indeed. which is something of an orphan science in, in, in a way that uh, uh, it's a legitimate science, but uh, it's on the very fringe. And there's certainly many, many people in uh, mainstream physics, biology, psychology who, who feel that uh, parapsychology doesn't exist, or at least it ought not to uh, exist. But you, you have gone out of your way to include parapsychological research uh, among uh, the other studies that you cite, and I think you go even further to suggest that it has a, a real function, a real place in uh, the cosmos of your understanding. Well, very much. I think, first of all, to say these aren't just my ideas, mm -hmm. what I'm bringing together. And there are some, you know, perhaps I've gone further and, and brought it all together in a synthesis that hasn't been done as yet by others, mm -hmm. but it's coming because this is the direction of travel. And unfortunately, fortunately, 20th century science gave us a major move forward in our understanding of reality. Yeah by describing our universe in terms of energy, matter, space, time. But it didn't go far enough because, first of all, it uh, didn't understand, and, and at that point mm -hmm. I understand why it didn't, the significance of information. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it, it peripheralized and took out the nature of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And for me as a cosmologist, cosmos is about the whole. If we can't understand cosmo uh, consciousness, if we can't in, you know, embody that yeah. in a perspective of the nature of reality, we don't have you know, an understanding of reality. And what's beautiful now is that the evidence is, is, is growing exponentially to reveal that all we call reality is essentially unified, that mind is matter and consciousness isn't something we have mm -hmm. or something that's just evolved. It's literally what we and the whole world are. Mm -hmm. One might say that you are a panpsychist. Yes, if you, yeah, I'm not great on labels mm -hmm. and even the word cosmologist, but, but yes, in the sense that that's been not just my experience all my life, but it's been, but it's now very much that leading edge science across many fields of research and all scales of existence mm -hmm. is coming to that same perspective. Mm -hmm. Of, of the nature of reality. Now, I know lots of skeptics of, of, of that Sorry. point of view, and when you say you're a panpsychist, the first thing they're likely to do is point to an object like this and say, you mean that's conscious? For me, consciousness is a very broad church. Yeah. yeah, it really is. And one of the reasons I didn't subtitle my book, Consciousness at the Center of Creation, mm -hmm. but subtitled it In Formation at the Center of Creation, mm -hmm. is that I'm very happy for us all to have a lovely discussion, debate, and exploration of consciousness, self-awareness, mm -hmm. different levels of it. But for me at the moment, within our human perspective and mm -hmm. perception, I feel it's important that we can get over the bridge from dual the duality-based appearance of reality yeah. to its true unified nature. And then we can have a lovely discussion and m much deeper dive mm -hmm. into what we understand as consciousness. Let's talk about the brain. Uh, the brain certainly seems to play a very unique role in human consciousness. Um, conventionally, it, it suggested that the brain creates consciousness, sort of the way the stomach creates digestion. How do you view it? Well, for me, all that we call reality is consciousness. Mm -hmm. 
at many different levels of self-awareness mm -hmm. and embodiment. You know, the, the idea, of course, mind arises from matter, but what we know now is that first of all, what we call matter is incredibly ephemeral and will of the wisp when we drill down to subatomic scales. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we now have the proof, the evidence that information is as real as anything we call material. Mm -hmm. So those two are converging in a really powerful way to, to, to start to restate the nature of, of our physicalized experience yeah. in our universe, not in terms of energy, matter, and space-time, but they are emergent phenomena mm -hmm. of information, of consciousness mm -hmm. expressing itself as information, and information expressing itself in complementary ways. So the understanding of our universe as emergent mm -hmm. appearance from these deeper realms mm -hmm. of, of re reality, when we do that, we then realize not only that information is reality, but that mind is matter, and matter is mind. And it's interesting that a lot of doctors and psychologists are actually realizing this. It's, I'm talking to quite a few neurosurgeons mm -hmm. who are saying this too, that, you know, th that that question for them is, is just the wrong question, that they absolutely understand that mind is matter. And so our brain is mm -hmm. essentially is is a moderator, a mm -hmm. modulator, mm -hmm. and transceiver, transceiver of uh -huh. consciousness. Uh -huh. But it is of itself consciousness. It mm -hmm. is itself information, mm -hmm. not. In other words, uh, one might think of the brain as akin to I, I'm going to say a living radio. Yeah, but what's living? Mm -hmm. You know, we can we can actually extend the the definition of mm -hmm. living to our entire universe. Mm -hmm. You know, if we go beyond the very limited biological perception mm -hmm. perceptions of this. So you ask about the statue. Yeah. The statue is informed. It is part of reality. Yeah. Everything is integrally reality mm -hmm. and all reality is informed mm -hmm. holographically manifest mm -hmm. and is essentially consciousness cosmic consciousness would you say with regard to this lovely work of art that uh, it's in some way different now that it's been sculpted than it was when it was just a, a stone in a mountain somewhere in a way yes because mm -hmm. if we see everything as as informed it has more um, complexity mm -hmm. and therefore it has a greater level of informational entropy or informational content mm -hmm. than it did when it was part of the mountain mm -hmm. because its informational content now connects it with the sculptor mm -hmm. with the intention of the sculptor with the form mm -hmm. with our interactions with it mm -hmm. with our viewers interactions with it mm -hmm. so our universe as it exists and evolves as a unified entity yeah. First of all, every moment mm -hmm. of time flowing forward, our universe embodies more and more informational content and therefore mm -hmm. conscious experience. Mm -hmm. And so when, whenever that beautiful sculpture was actually part of a mountain, you know, of itself, if it was still part of the mountain, our universe would have moved on. But it has moved on specifically through the co-creativity mm -hmm. of the sculptor. Now, th there is an art form... Uh, referred to as psychometry, where yes. a person with certain uh, supernormal abilities would be able to uh, read into this its own history. It might be a, 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 a clair clairvoyant or a psychometrist would be able to tell me about the people who sculpted this mm -hmm. and maybe even tell me about the people who mined this sure. stone it, itself, sure. that they've left uh, mental impressions that are somehow captured here in, in the stone. Well, it, it's all informational mm -hmm. and I would say that we all have supernormal 
uh, abilities. Yeah. It's just that our culture closes them down so early mm -hmm. that it's only a few folks who are particularly sensitive yeah. or particularly rebellious mm -hmm. that can, can go through and, and continue to have those supernormal abilities. But we all have them. It's part of our intrinsic nature. Yeah. And our intrinsic nature is as a microcosmic, co-creative consciousness of our entire universe. So yes, to psychometrize the information, because with each moment as space expands and time flows, not only does our universe embody more and more information, but that information is never lost. Mm -hmm. So we have that past information of the universe knowing itself in every moment supernormal abilities of you know including psychometry can tap into that uh -huh. past incremental uh, accumulation of information now when you say the information is never lost some people may be shocked uh, I mean some people would probably hope that some information would get Please lost lose it <laughs> yeah uh, Freud for example said we don't want to know what's in our own mind that may be the case yeah. doesn't mean it's lost yeah it can be mislaid it can be suppressed mm -hmm. it can be put at the back it can whatever right. but physicists have a real issue if it was lost mm -hmm. because quantum mechanics and the laws of physics absolutely rely on the fact that information is not lost and you're speaking as a scientist I am speaking when, as a scientist when you say absolutely that, that, that the uh, conservation of matter and energy applies to information it's as well. more than the conservation of energy matter it's the fact that the second law of thermodynamics when we restate it as a second law of infodynamics mm -hmm. uh, and in and entropy as being the informational content mm -hmm. of a system entropy informational entropy always increases so throughout our entire universe from the beginning within space-time uh -huh. as an attribute of space-time information is not lost your colleague Irvin Laszlo uh, refers to the uh, Akashic field or the indeed. Akashic records as uh, the embodiment of all information indeed and, and Irvin very much describes you know the universe in the same way that I do as being informed and holographically manifest so for him he's just using a different terminology to describe this accumulation of information that is accessible because mm -hmm. we're innately part of our universe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have a background in criminology we were discussing Indeed. earlier. Uh, in a sense, it would mean that uh, every crime that's ever committed could, in principle, be solved. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Everything that manifests within space time essentially has an informational signature and an informational story. Mm -hmm. And I, I sometimes wonder if the the human cultural uh, need or felt need to suppress these levels of consciousness is sort of uh, a, a, an effort, a primordial effort to cover up crime. Oh, good gracious. I've never thought of it in those terms. Mm -hmm. I, my sense is it, it's even more generic than that. You mm -hmm. know, if if... I, I talk about actors, mm -hmm. okay, and actors tend to fall into two categories. There's the method actor, yep. right, that really delves deep into, becomes the role, mm -hmm. okay, and, there, and there's the other type of actor that always knows they're playing a role, yep. and it seems that when we come into human form, into human incarnation, a lot of us become method actors and really identify ourselves mm -hmm. with this role and this body and this perspective. Mm -hmm. And others are sort of more perceiving that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Mm -hmm. And it feels to me important that we do go some way to allying ourselves with this role. That's what we came to do. That's what mm -hmm. we came to be, perhaps to learn, to mm -hmm. experience, to grow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just having this sense of we are spiritual beings. Yeah, and we are human beings. Mm -hmm. And so that, that balance between being here and being now and yeah. being grounded mm -hmm. in physical reality mm -hmm. means that in a way a level of not knowingness mm -hmm. a level of, of, of you know perhaps encapsulating mm -hmm. our humanness is really important in being human mm -hmm. and yet not forgetting yeah. that we have that connection 
Well, sometimes when I go to the theater, I get uh, so caught up in a, in a motion picture that it's as if I'm in the movie. I forget that I'm sitting in the theater. <laughs> I know. Mm -hmm. Oh, my husband says, because I, you know, if it's something like Star Wars, which I love all, I'm grabbing his hand so tight, mm -hmm. you know, it's get off. <laughs> I'm absolutely in there. Yeah. And that's fine when it's a film, and that's fine to some degree. Yeah. But when our human experience persuades us, of the separation between us mm -hmm. and perhaps the fears that come from that perceived separation and the conflicts that come from that separation and the dysfunctional behaviors that come from that separation mm -hmm. then i feel it's time for us as i feel we are now to remember who we really are mm -hmm. that we are spiritual beings microcosmic co-creators of our realities having a human experience and that term co-creator, it's, it's something of a buzzword, but I know you mean it very seriously. Very seriously. As uh, a responsibility that we now have based on the uh, evolution of science and culture to the point where, where we have a, a grasp on how we can really begin to, uh, as a species, uh, take control of our own future evolution. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't want to be heavy with the idea of responsibility because I feel this is a, a lovely song and an invitation to mm -hmm. do this and to step forward into understanding, experiencing and embody the unity awareness of unified reality, mm -hmm. which is where, as you say, all the science is coming towards that reconciles with, with spirit universal mm -hmm. spiritual experiences. And it's incredibly empowering. Because unity awareness doesn't mean this sort of homogeneity. Mm -hmm. When we do this, when we actually get to this understanding, we realize how unified reality has differentiated itself into this glorious universe, this beautiful planet. Each of us are unique, and yet collectively, however diverse we are, we have this wonderful commonality of being part of a human family. We have this amazing, abundant planet. How beautiful she is. And, and so as we remember the, the, that unity, mm -hmm. we can celebrate the diversity, we can empower the unique me-ness, mm -hmm. and come the me and the we. And oh my goodness, where's that going to take us? I mean, I'm so excited mm -hmm. by the potential and the possibility of how remembering, yeah. you know, and, and embodying unity awareness. We're like kids, you know, we're like, oh my goodness, where's this going to take us as our next step of conscious mm -hmm. evolution? Well, when you ask the question, where is that going to take us? I, I know there are many visions of yeah. uh, Alpha and the Omega. Uh, that we're heading toward a, a future of, of some sort. And it uh, makes me you know, wonder about precognition, a, a topic we've discussed, uh, precognition and time. We've, we've talked about <coughs> time in an earlier interview as, as being related to uh, Boltzmann's law of entropy. Yes, but as informational content of our entire universe. Mm -hmm. So as our entire universe evolves, time flows because the flow of time itself is that increase of informational content every moment mm -hmm. um, of our universe's existence mm -hmm. and evolution. You, you Earlier you described a wonderful metaphor for thinking about precognition as uh, the advance wave of, of coming from the prow of a ship as mm. it moves through the ocean. Yeah, you know, if you see a ship moving across a lake or an ocean, at the front of the ship, there's a sort of a bow wave, mm -hmm. and it's rather like a sort of a, a, a sort of a just forming, you know, yeah. um, before then the ship moves through it. And it seems the best sort of evidence that I can put together mm -hmm. uh, as an explanation for both precognition, which a lot of evidence supports, is that as the, our universe moves forward, at that point of the, the nowness of it, there is a bow wave beyond that, mm -hmm. where reality, physical reality, is not yet crystallized mm -hmm. into the now, mm -hmm. but its possibilities and potentialities are doing so. Mm -hmm. um, 
so that's how I, I perceive the precognition. Mm -hmm. But also it's an understanding perhaps how consciousness comes into its manifestation. Because we talked in an earlier interview about how non-physicalized attractors of consciousness actually form boundary systems, mm -hmm. whether it's of an ecosystem or indeed of our collective psyche. Mm -hmm. And we talked about conflicts and how, you know, there's an attractor base perhaps of our of our separation or perceived separation that gives rise to fear based behaviors of which conflicts is one manifestation and how we can co-create an attractor of peace mm -hmm. and a co-attractor of love. And when complex systems are at the point of unsustainability, their, their, their attractor basins become, um, you know, the start to fall, the boundaries mm -hmm. start to dis decohere. Yeah. Okay. And what happens is there's a possibility of either falling into disorder of mm -hmm. chaos mm -hmm. or creating a move into a high level of coherence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it seems to me that in our collective consciousness at the moment, that attractor of our perceived separation, you know, of the world, how we see it, how we experience it from that fragmented understanding is falling away. Our boundaries are, are, are you know, falling mm -hmm. away. Our, our behaviors are unsustainable. Mm -hmm. How we are in the world is unsustainable. At the same time, in this bow wave of potentiality, yeah. there's a higher level of coherence mm -hmm. being formed. And what happens in complex systems is something called flickering. Mm. And what happens is that consciousness is sort of trying to move to this higher level of, of coherence, whether it's an ecosystem or whether it's our collective psyche, mm -hmm. and then it falls back. Yeah. So it's almost like we're we're potentializing this high level of coherence mm -hmm. of the understanding and experiencing embodying unity yeah. awareness, but the old paradigm mm -hmm. is still pulling us back. But when the flickering is getting stronger as more and more people mm -hmm. are intentionalizing yeah. this, we're moving forward. Uh, what an elegant description. I, I get the impression, and, and perhaps I'm completely off base here, but uh, it seems as if uh, this beautiful description in your hand language is amazing in and of itself. I hope our viewers will pay attention to, to that. But, uh, but are, it, I get the impression you're describing uh, what mathematicians sometimes think of in catastrophe theory. They do, but they're really describing it more now in terms of complexity. Mm -hmm. Because when there is an emergence of, of, for example, a biological entity, mm -hmm. when that emergence happens, that entity moves from a level of complexity and coherence to a higher level mm -hmm. of coherence, whether it's a single cell to a multi-cell being, mm -hmm. whether it's a, an organelle to an organ, mm -hmm. whether it's a, a, a sort of a very simple ecosystem to a more complex ecosystem. Complexity embodies higher levels of coherence. Now what happens is there could be a situation at that point where a calamity happens. So for example, 65 million years ago, the ecosystem of Gaia had got to a level of complexity. Yes. And then an asteroid came mm -hmm. in and, and, and destroyed a great deal of, of the biological ecosystem. Wiped out the dinosaurs Wiped that were once dinosaurs. very prevalent right here in Nevada. As you know, because you were the, <laughs> the, the discoverer of the first dinosaur footprints in Nevada. Which in, is in this state. That's, so I, cool. I was with two of my friends, and, and that's true. We did. But so cool. Yeah. But the thing is, when that catastrophe happened, mm -hmm. the, the, the little creatures who are our ancestors, our mm. mammalia ancestors, yes. there was an opportunity uh -huh. for Gaia to then develop a higher level of coherence. So yes, there was a catastrophe, but from that catastrophe, mm -hmm. there were still seeds Tiny of possibility. Tiny little mammals, probably smaller than mice. Yeah, uh -huh. that then became all of the mammals that, that we, we, we have on, on, on our Earth now. Yeah. So even when there is that 
falling, mm -hmm. there is nonetheless, unless the entirety of our planetary biosphere was wiped out, there's always that possibility, consciousness, life will find a way. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, yes, there can be a calamity, but it doesn't always have to be a catastrophe. And often a, a biological emergence can go from that level of mm -hmm. complexity to that level mm -hmm. of higher level of coherence without a catastrophe. The question is, what's going to happen with us? Yeah. Because if we don't do that, mm -hmm. the chances are we'll do that. Well, you seem to... Um identify not just with your your own human embodiment but I, I get a sense that you feel comfortable identifying with those tiny little mammals and maybe even earlier life forms as well am, am I correct oh much more than that uh -huh. <laughs> for me life is is the cosmos you know it's and, far beyond biological and you existence. talked about the communication with uh, conscious disembodied beings yes for me, right from early childhood, as I said before, you know, consciousness isn't something we have, it's what we and the whole world are. Mm -hmm. Many different levels of awareness, many different levels of perception, mm -hmm. many different scales mm -hmm. of perception. Mm -hmm. So for me, my whole life has been an exploration of those different levels, mm -hmm. you know, an exploration of of the nature of reality, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, whatever level I've been fortunate enough to be able to access and perceive and communicate with, and and the universe as as a whole being interconnected consciously, yeah, like a giant hologram. We're talking about exactly. uh, trillions and trillions of. Uh, planetary systems Indeed. and star systems and potential life forms yes. and uh, even though they may be uh, separated from us by thousands and thousands of, of light years uh, through consciousness that connection can be instantaneous. Indeed, indeed and as our universe and you know the, the, the real the leading edge but there's a really exponentially growing body of evidence at mm -hmm. all scales and at many, many different fields of research that this is the case, that our universe exists and evolves as a finite, unified entity within the infinity mm -hmm. of, of cosmic mind. Do you sometimes find yourself overwhelmed by uh, the knowledge of all this? <laughs> I say fully whelmed, not uh -huh. quite overwhelmed, uh -huh. <laughs> teetering on the edge of overwhelmed sometimes, uh -huh. but, but it's... It, it, you know, this is over 60 years of exploration, mm -hmm. you know, through science, through, you know, being in international business and being very grounded through all of that route, through mm -hmm. ancient understanding, archaeology, all these threads mm -hmm. and experiences mm -hmm. have been a, a, a progressive journey. So some of that journey has been a big leap and some of it's been baby steps and some of it's sort of turned on a turned round and gone you know the wrong way for a, or not the wrong way but you know a, a side avenue mm -hmm. so it's it's been all of this journey to this point and beyond now as an archaeologist mm -hmm. one of your areas of focus has been the uh, the creation myths as i understand it of ancient people and how those myths seem to be in accordance with what we now know scientifically well some are mm -hmm. some are not not everyone are but but some of the deeper ones for example the ancient Vedic mm -hmm. traditions of India are very profound insights into the nature of reality and and others too um, and it's not just the creation myths that, that was the basis of my, my doctorate thesis it was how people in ancient times perceived themselves and the mm. cosmos so what was their cosmology not just the creation but what was their relationship mm -hmm. with the, the cosmos mm -hmm. so i've been very fortunate to have many many experiences with wisdom keepers from many traditions mm -hmm. and also insights and, and archaeological perspectives for example why people built monuments you know mm. i live in in england very near to a place called Avebury and Stonehenge, I've been there. where mm -hmm. thousands of, as you know, thousands of years ago and, and elsewhere, people were were, were monumentalising yes. the landscape, mm -hmm. perhaps to connect heaven and earth through human experience. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's all of that. How do we, how do we perceive ourselves? How do we perceive our relationships with each other mm -hmm. and the whole world? 
And, and it seems to me that's one of the most important functions of uh, cosmology is how does the human individual uh, in, uh, presumably or apparently uh, or mistakenly isolated fit into the universe as a whole? Exactly. And that requires us to actually bring consciousness into the very heart of this because mainstream science for, for a long time and is, is still to some degree trying to, well, first of all, trying to understand consciousness, but perceiving it in a very duality-based way, mm -hmm. so that somehow consciousness or mind arises from matter. What well, we're on the threshold now of, of understanding that mind is matter. And so consciousness is absolutely crucial to our understanding of the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. Well, Jude Kuravan, we've covered a lot of ground here, and, and I could ask uh, many, many questions. I know we can go in, in, a, in a lot of different directions. But, well, one point before um, we conclude our interview, let's talk about Gaia, mm -hmm. the, the Earth itself. I know that uh, this is very important in, in many of the uh, original peoples of yeah. of the earth they have a a close connection to the planet uh, some e even western philosophers i think such as leibniz felt that the earth is alive mm. again I, I i feel we need to expand our our perception of what living is beyond biology mm -hmm. um and a friend of mine Dwayne elgin wrote a beautiful book called the living universe yes and you know we describe ourselves as biocosmic beings mm -hmm. in that sense. So Gaia was the name given to the earth goddess by the ancient Greeks. And it's a, it was, in modern times, it started to come forward as a hypothesis mm -hmm. by a researcher called James Lovelock, yes. who perceived the earth as a homeostatic system, mm -hmm. where everything is interconnected and relates to everything else, mm -hmm. to allow life, mm -hmm. biological life, to emerge and to be nurtured over the last four, four and a half billion years. And I write about this in The Cosmic Hologram because the nature of information, not as random data, but as patterned in formation, in hyphen formation, in forming mm -hmm. the world, is very clear in the way that Gaia uh, operates as it were yeah. and so it's this understanding is really emergent now and it's emergent in a very important respect in that mm -hmm. we in my view mm -hmm. need to heal our relationship not just with each other but with mm -hmm. Gaia literally as Mother Earth our planetary mother who we depend on mm -hmm. for everything mm -hmm. and we've trashed her and we've polluted her and we've treated her very very badly probably and in my view certainly because of our misunderstanding of the nature of reality we've seen her as separate and we need now to understand that we are intimately interconnected with her health is our health. Our do you, well -being do you is experience well -being. Gaia as as a conscious entity? Yes, in different ways than I experience you as a conscious mm -hmm. entity, but nonetheless, you know, given that very broad definition yes. that I have of consciousness, mm -hmm. that it isn't what we have, it's what we and the whole world are, mm -hmm. yes indeed. I do. Mm -hmm. And I feel that regardless of whether others do to that degree, that as a species, it is absolutely vital mm -hmm. that we heal our relationship with her and actually perceiving her mm -hmm. as a living being, mm -hmm. perceiving her as a benevolent mother mm -hmm. on whom we depend, yeah. even if that's not that full communion, is an enormous step forward in mm -hmm. how we treat her, mm -hmm. how we are with her, mm -hmm. and how we then transform our behaviors mm -hmm. with regard to her. Now you spoke about uh, understanding Gaia as a conscious entity, but different from 
Jeffrey is a conscious entity. Uh, I did an interview on panpsychism once with a, a philosopher, Christian De Quincey, and he made a point of uh, focusing on what he called the uh, holes, meaning holistic, yeah, that, that uh, a, 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 a planet or an yeah. animal or a human or uh, we are holes. And, and, and so we are, a, a, we have a conscious self. Yes. Uh, whereas perhaps this lovely statue is an aggregate rather than a whole. And it, it, the statue may not possess a, a self in the same way that a human does. I think that's a fair point. I mm -hmm. think, though, from what I was saying earlier, yeah. uh, I don't want to impose my perspectives on anyone else. Yeah. What I, I'm offering is an invitation mm -hmm. to, you know, continue our journey as a species mm -hmm. from duality-based to unity-based awareness. And then different folks will have different perceptions, mm -hmm. but the perceptions will, instead of being perhaps that they might see the statue as separate or Jeffrey separate from Jude, mm -hmm. that they will learn to understand, experience, embody the, the, the unified reality of which we're all right. a part, mm -hmm. and yet the individuation, mm -hmm. the wonderful, abundant, multidimensional, mm -hmm. diverse mm -hmm. realization of that. Uh, beautifully put. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, so we can have unity and plurality. Yes, and, and unity and diversity. That's uh -huh. the whole thing. It's that. It's not homogeneity. It's this amazing heterogeneity, abundance, diversity. You know, consciousness is never bored because mm. <laughs> <laughs> nothing's ever the same. It's different. It's uh -huh. diverse. It's differentiated. Jude Curavan, thank you so much for sharing this with me. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. Thank I you hope so you much. come back often. <laughs> I'll be delighted to. Mm -hmm. thank and thank you for being with us as well. Mm -hmm.